All right. Well, howdy folks. My name is Jessica Nadd and I'm the executive director for Great Plains Regeneration. We are a new nonprofit org that has really bloomed out of this really amazing group of farmers and ranchers and folks that are looking to really regenerate um, areas of the high plains. I do have a short presentation for you today. I promise to keep it short and, uh, and simple. And then we're gonna get to our speakers. We have Dale Strickler and we have Lucinda Stunkel with us today. So here we go, Great Plains Generation. Thanks for being here. Um, today, we're going to be talking from Dale Strickler. He is the author of multiple books. I've got them right here. I'm pretty lucky to have an autographed copy of these books. And if you're able to pick up your own copies at your favorite book retailers and then attend a GPR event, there's a good chance you will run into Dale Strickler and he'll sign your book for you. Lucinda Stunkel is also a, an amazing farmer, rancher, producer in Kansas who has an amazing story of the work that she does farming, ranching, and she's a mentor and educator and, and does a lot of different things with an emphasis of bringing up that next generation of farmers to be able to farm and do it with soil health in mind. So um, next week, big announcement, uh, we're gonna have Rick Clark on the webinar and GPR is going back to weekly webinar series because of harvest and because of other things we were doing the monthly, but we're back. And next week, we're going to hear from Rick Clark. Um, this webinar is sponsored by Purist. And this question of how do we, um, you know, how do we capitalize on these new markets that are coming out right now for different crops, for different seeds? And that's what we're going to talk about. So a little bit about GPR is we believe we can build an amazing food system. We can enhance it. We believe that consumer health and environmental health are one and the same um, and that rural life can be enhanced. So a little bit about who we are, what we're up to. Um, we have a board of directors that has folks from Kansas, Nebraska, Oklahoma. Um, we've got some more people in the waiting room. Texas, um, we've got Ray Archuleta not pictured on here. He is an advisor to Great Plains Regeneration. We, some of our partner groups are um, Regenerate Oklahoma, Regenerate Nebraska, we are also doing some strategic partnerships with the Winnebago tribe, as well as the Prairie Band Potawatomi tribe here in Kansas. And I will let you in on a little bit of that um, here in a minute. Oh, I got some duplicate slides. Okay, so Kansas um, Alliance for Wetlands and Streams is our um, fiscal sponsor. And this is a really great relationship that we have bloomed here out of Kansas because they are focusing heavily on preserving the lands uh, and the water for the people and Great Plains Regeneration has a special emphasis on farmers and ranchers and building that biodiversity. We believe that by working together, we can close this loop of the great work that we're doing um, on our farms and ranches back into that civic engagement. Um, so, I think I'm getting some feedback. If you're not on mute, would you mind muting for me? That would be fantastic. Next month, raise your hand if you like free bear. I can see you all. So I wanna see your hands raised, right? Okay, so next month we're hosting a fundraiser in Lawrence, Kansas. Our good buddy, Darren Unruh, who's raising the roof down there. Um, he helped provide some turkey red winter wheat for um, the brewer who's bringing this, this, this wheat, this beer for us. And so we're going to have a regenerative beer. It'll be Saturday, August 21st in Lawrence, Kansas. And I think you should all come. Um, more importantly, we're now getting some merch and we'll have some links to our website. So you can check out the amazing merchandise. You can get geared up uh, with the GPR logo, let people know that you support us. And um, we would greatly appreciate that. So the way that GPR is executing our mission is through farmer-led educational events and outreach, which thank you, you guys are all a part of today. Uh, we're working on watershed restoration with our partners, Kansas Alliance of Wetlands and Streams. And this idea of regenerative marketplace, how do we build a better food system that allows us to produce nutrient-rich food and get them to the market and get them into the hands of the folks that wanna eat them. So that's a heavy focus for GPR right now. 
And I'm going to skip through a few more of these slides and get right to our presentation. So, Mr. Dale Strickler, how are you? I am extremely well. I excited to be here. Well, thank you for coming on the GPR webinar. Um, so, Dale, would you like to give an introduction about yourself and um, a little bit about the work you do? And let's just kickstart everything. And folks, let's be interactive. Stick all of your questions in the chat. After Dale gives a presentation, we're going to kind of go into some Q&A and then we'll queue up Lucinda. So, Dale, I'm going to step away and hand it over to you. Okay, I uh, well, I, gr I grew up here in southeast Kansas. I, I uh, went to Kansas State University, got um, a couple degrees there, um, uh, masters in in agronomy, and then I taught at a community college for fifteen years, uh, taught agronomy mostly, and then entered private industry and and ended up uh, eventually coming to work for Green Cover Seed, which Cover crops have been a source of fascination for me for years and years. And uh, I, I grew my first one in 1988, way back when I was still in college. And I've just been fascinating by the concept that you can make your soil better. When I was, when I was a kid growing up uh, in, here in Southeast Kansas, um, every summer in, in June, our corn would look amazing. And in July, it would die because our our soil just did not have moisture holding capacity. And it, it's just a horribly frustrating thing to see your livelihood just literally dry up before your eyes. And so I, I thought it was just because we didn't get enough rain. And then I found out later when I went to college that southeast Kansas gets the same rainfall as central Iowa but we don't get the same results because Iowa has soil and we have clay. And, and so I, I kind of have had this lifelong dream of being able to, to fix soil, to make it better. And that's what led me to the cover crop path and the cover crops led to this whole soil health movement. And so, um, I got the opportunity to uh, a year ago to uh, green cover seed bought a warehouse just 10 miles from where I grew up and they offered me the opportunity to move back where I grew up and so here I am I'm I'm home again and uh, very very excited about the things that I can do here right where I grew up and and where all those early lessons of uh, dysfunctional soil are, are still very impactful in my mind. So that's awesome. So Dale, um, I've heard you present a number of times. What are the biggest, when, when you're going to a group of producers that might be inter introduced to soil health concepts for the first time, you have a great way of connecting right off the bat in your presentation. I'm wondering if you could kind of launch with, with, with the round here talk. Oh, uh, okay. Well, uh, whenever it's, it's not unique to soil health, it, it, it's, but whenever, whenever you present a new idea to a group of farmers, it's, uh, uh, the immediate response there'd be this group there sitting in the back with their arms folded like you know you're not going to convince me of anything um you know and you say you know and you present an idea and they say well that won't work around here and and i i you know i <laughs> say i i've yet to find the the name of the town round here anywhere on a map um so I, I've done some searching. I figured out where round here refers to. Round here is bounded on the west side. Well, let me get my head turned correctly. Well, on the south side by this ear and on the north side by this ear. And, and it's right here. And, and it's absolutely true. Nothing ever works there. Um, because 
for every person who said that won't work around here, there's a neighbor who's making it work right across the fence line. And then of course, the narrative changes to, well, they get more rain than I do. The, the rain stops at the barbed wire fence or the field boundary, you know, or they've got better soil than I do. Well, of course they do. They're doing the things that we're recommending. That's why they have, you know, it's not accident. They create better soil. And, and when I was in college, I was taught that you better buy good soil because you cannot change it. And what I was taught was absolutely incorrect, absolutely incorrect. And um, my, my farm that I had previously when I lived up in North Central Kansas, uh, when I started down this soil regeneration process, um, I took a uh, grid sample and my soil organic matter averaged 1.9%. It was an irrigated corn soybean farm. And I start, began to implement some of these soil health practices that I knew and eventually uh, planted perennial grass and uh, perennial grass legume forb mixture, uh, inoculated with mycorrhizal fungi, did daily movement grazing, and in 16 years, I increased that soil organic matter from 1.9 to 8.7. That's, that's in a decade and a half. You know, I was told in college by a number of PhD soil scientists that that is impossible because that's what they were taught. You know, they were parroting what they had been taught by their professors. It, it's... It's not impossible, and, and I'm not unique. I mean, we, we've, I'm sure everybody on here has probably read or listened to Gabe Brown talk about his soil improvement, um, and there's a number of stories out there, and some of them that never really been made public, but there are people, there's person after person after person who has dramatically improved their soil in a short period of time, and if you, uh, look at uh, Gail Fuller, I'm not sure if he's on here or not, but uh, Gail has a saying, you know, um, soil is the answer, what is the question? And I would probably modify that. I would say soil organic matter is the answer. What is the question? Or soil with more, more carbon is the answer. What is the question? Because if you look at so many of the ills of mankind- I'm doing good. <laughs> Throw all that stuff in here. Um, if you look at all, all the ills of mankind, um, you know, famine, <laughs> the four horsemen of the apocalypse and the book of yeah. revelations, famine, pestilence, warfare, debt, you know, all those things, those can all be traced to soil misuse. You, 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 and does he fix that? You make a much happier and healthier society all across the planet and a healthier planet. I mean, not just humans, but every every organism that lives on this planet will thrive if we improve our soil. It, it's, it's that simple. So Dale, um, a couple questions. When you go to work with producers or when you go to some of these events, um, I had somebody asked me just yesterday, where are we at with the soil health conversation? Are, what are the number one questions that you're getting asked um, to give answers to? And then, um, and maybe I'll just load up a couple questions and you can, you can go from there. What's, what's the biggest thing that blows people, people's mind that they don't realize? Um, you know, you've kind of talked about, you were told that you had to buy the best soil. So two things, you know, what questions are you hearing and what's the biggest thing that blows people's mind when you start on this conversation? It depends on where they're at in the spectrum as far as how far they've gone down this soil health pathway. I think the first thing, uh, if they have no experience, uh, we have been conditioned for years and years that, um, yeah, we can conserve soil, but it's, it's gonna cost us a lot of money. You know, if, if you're gonna make better soil, you, you're gonna have to 
sacrifice economically and and to be a steward of the soil you have to be a, a selfless you know you essentially have to sacrifice your financial future you know fall on the sword to make better soil and and that's absolutely not the case i think the biggest realization is that these processes that build healthier soil also build healthier profits and, and if that is indeed the case if if you know i i in any human endeavor i like to find the win-win situation um you know doing the right thing also makes you more money because a lot of times people do the wrong thing because it makes them more money what if doing the right thing makes you more money if that's the case is there any reason to not do the right thing you know um you know, and you can call it greed if you want to. I, I call it a desire for a better future for your family. Um, if doing the right thing by the soil and, and ultimately for the planet also gives you a better life and a better future for your family, why would you not do this? I mean, <laughs> it's inconceivable to me that people would not be going down this path. And I think, you know, I, I guess the mission of, of this organization is to bring that same message to more and more people and and show them that not only is this the right thing to do, but it makes you more money and it makes not just healthier bottom line, but it also makes uh, healthier communities. Now, how many people are uh, the county next to where I used to live? Um, in the 1950s had 12 high schools and now there's one and it's a little 1a school that plays eight-man football there used to be 12 high schools in that county we've experienced a great degree of rural depopulation and uh, how much time do I have here Jessica I've got a, <laughs> I've got a story here that I'd like to share on that very thing no, I think you should share it. You know, um, it's always funny because I just, I feel like all I do is queue up a framework for discussion and then I, you know, mesh people together who want to have the discussion. So I'd say go for it. Uh, this is a very near topic to my heart. I'm going to put a couple links in the chat to support this. So go, okay. go right ahead. Um, the, uh, if, if you've seen the movie Apollo 13, the moment where the you know the lunar mod or the uh the uh the craft they're in malfunctions and they have to get into the lunar module and try to make it back to earth in the lunar module without the rest of the aircraft and you know they've got you know no, i mean the science says there's not enough oxygen for them to stay alive until they get back to earth you know houston we have a problem and there's a scene in that movie where they take out on the table, there's all the components of that lunar module. And it's like, uh, guys, this is what they have to work with, figure out a way to bring them back alive. And I thought, that's kind of like every Sunday afternoon when I was growing up on the farm because we always broke down on Saturday night and the parts stores closed on Sunday. And dad would say, go through the scrap pile and find something to fix this planter so we can go tomorrow. And I said, I bet those guys grew up on a farm. And then I, I heard, you know, I can't swear to that this is true, but I, I heard Jim Lovell, who is the commander of that mission, say that he owes his life to the fact that all 25 people in that command center, every single one, grew up on a farm. Now, you can argue about the value of putting somebody on the moon. You know, it's like, what did it accomplish? But I think there's no argument that it's the most, it may not be the most valuable achievement in human history, but it's, it's undoubtedly the most amazing achievement in human history to put a person on another planetary body. You know, and, uh, that's just mind boggling even now. 50 years later. Um, and the I, I calculated the random odds uh, 
at that time, 5% of the US population grew up on a farm. And so the odds that all 25 people in there grew up on a farm was random accident is 0.05 to the 25th power. I don't know the name for a number that big. That's not random accident. Farm kids were in that command center for a reason. You learn skills on a farm that you learn no other place. The best product that we ever produced on our farms is, is not corn, it's not wheat, it's not soybeans or cattle. It's our children. And we have had an agriculture of get big or get out, farm fence row to fence row, specialize. We have been going the wrong direction for too long. And what we have lost in that, yeah, we're still producing beef, we're still producing corn, we're still producing wheat, but what we're not producing is communities and farm kids. And I fear for a future that has no farm kids because every civilization seems to take its greatest leap when the first generation leaves the farm and goes to the city and takes all those skills and those thought processes that they learned growing up on a farm, that problem solving ability and goes to the city and puts it into other endeavors. And we, we, we can no longer do that as a country. And so I am, I am just really hopeful for this organization to reverse that trend and get people back out on the land where we need people and, and get rid of this desire that bigger is better when it comes to farms and the industries. It's not. It's truly not better. It's worse. So Dale, I mean, kind of thanks for queuing up GPR here because, you know, it's been years upon years of conversation with a lot of key stakeholders that are helping form this um, organization. And I would say at least weekly, sometimes more than weekly, I have people that want to have a discovery call with GPR about the missing technology in agriculture. And, and you know, I think that there's a place and a time for, for inputs and for biologicals and stuff like that. But I do, I have, do you think that because of this disconnect from the farm, we're now trying to innovate ourselves out of a problem that really just has to do with biology? <laughs> well, uh, you, you probably know Ted Alexander. He, he worked for NASA. He was a legitimate rocket scientist. And I tormented him one day because I said, uh, Ted said, I, I understand you NASA guys back in the 60s spent uh, 11 or actually it's $50 million in the 60s developing a, a ink pen that would work in zero gravity. And the Russians use pencils. So, <laughs> you know, it's like sometimes in our in our quest for cleverness, uh, we ignore wisdom. And all, I, I wrote an article one time, everything I need to farm, I can find at the county dump. Uh, basically, I drove to the county dump one day and, and it, it, it dawned on me. It was just a beautiful Saturday morning. Sun was shining. Okay, that's input one. There's this big pile of wood chips that I could spread on my farm that would retain mulch you know, retain moisture and, and increase the uh, rainfall in capacity of the soil. And there's this big pile of leaf compost that has minerals and organic matter and, and food for microbes in it. And I thought, okay, the sunlight's happening on my farm. If I hold this and this to my farm, I have everything I need to grow plants right there. And 99% of what it takes to grow plants, we can obtain from the atmosphere or from the soil for free. And we tend to seek technological solutions to problems that are usually created by technological solutions. You know, we, we I mean, we're still, <laughs> 
we're trying to use biology to solve problems that were caused by by tillage. You know, tillage now was the original. There. <laughs> you know, we were we were caused by tillage in the first place. So yeah. if lacking you know, that was the original agriculture technology and it was very clever, you know, me stir soil, me get bigger crop. You know, that that happened 7,000 years ago, uh, probably somewhere in the Fertile Crescent, you know, me stir soil, me get bigger crop. Whoa, this is great. Let's do this everywhere. And we did. And it's like, you know, me use debit card, me have better lifestyle. <laughs> It catches up to you. You know, we, we didn't create wealth. We cashed it in. We cashed Absolutely. in our inheritance. And so now our, our charge is how do we restore that wealth that used to be in the soil? And, of course, um, cover crops are, you know, I do work for Green Cover Seed. Here we go. So I, I need to put in my, my plug for cover crops. Uh, <laughs> cover crops are uh, and cover crops are a tool. You know, they are not a principle. They are a tool. They're a means of providing living roots and root exudates for a longer period of the year uh, than what we would typically do within our cropping rotation. And um, we're really just scratching the surface of what we can do to build uh, soil organic matter, soil carbon, soil biology, um, and, and eventually, you know, a healthier, well-aggregated soil that functions as all of the things that we ask of a soil. So. Absolutely. Well, I see um, Lucinda shaking her head. Um, I know that we're in for a really great conversation. So <laughs> if it's okay, I would like to introduce. Is she shaking it up and down? Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> All right. Well, folks, we've got Lucinda on the line with us. She grew up on a dairy farm in Kansas where her responsibilities were the bulls, the replacement heifers, and the show cattle. After college, she became a college professor, but gave that up for a career to marry a farmer. This is your bio. You're kind of looking at me weird. Um, also wanted to mention that, as you know, Lucinda is going to get into her story and she is a woman who has persevered in the face of many obstacles. And so um, I'm just, I'm proud to be your friend, Lucinda. I'm proud that you're here talking with us and please take it away. Happy to have you. Can you see that? Okay, uh, I knew Dale before he went to Green Cover Seed, long before, and most of the um, mixes that we plant on our farm are designed by Dale. So, um, Dale, you did a, just did a great introduction to what we're doing, and what we want to do uh, is, instead of going to the dump to get stuff, is to um, actually grow the biology to grow those plants and then uh, roller crimp them down or um, use grazing to trample them into the soil to make our biology that way. And this is a short presentation of how we've been doing it. This is our 10-way summer grazing mix. Um, we've planted acres and acres of this after wheat, but we also have some dedicated plots where we are um, um, planting it uh, one cover crop after another solely for uh, the purposes of grazing. This was um, planted into uh, flooded acres and by the time the water went down and it dried out enough to get on there, um, it was um, the middle of the growing season so we just planted this and uh, that's what it, it looked like. We had um, the legumes and the BMR dwarf sorghum sedan, the dwarf because it has more leaves than the full size one and the BMR so that brown midrib so that they will eat the stalk as well. Um, crabgrass, millet, um, all are on the grass side. And then we have other uh, forbs like buckwheat, okra, sunflower and safflower. And the okra is fantastic. You wouldn't believe how much they go after the okra. I never would have guessed to put that one in. 
biological primer is basically the floor sweepings and leftovers <laughs> from green cover seed and uh, it really gives you a lot of uh, stuff, um, act additional stuff there. Um, mixed the, um, um, when I was inoculating the um, legumes, ended up also um, mixing in some biazo fungi and mycorrhizal fungi uh, on the seed. So the seed had it right there ready to sprout and grow. And then I put companions with the soybeans that I planted in another field. And this is what it looked like. Um, so we could have the ground more completely covered. And that is rye um, put down under those soybeans. And then this uh, um, cover crop, our companions added into that buckwheat, mustard, and radish. Doesn't take very much. Um, I want everything here to bloom so that it's bringing the beneficials in. And this is what, look how many pods are on there. That's more than we've had before. And then I also planted companions with our Milo. Um, first I grazed off the alfalfa because it had been there for nine years when I bought the place and I thought that maybe we needed to put something else in there because it was starting to go the other way. And this is what um, I put in for the um, inner seeding. Buckwheat, flax, mustard, Korean lespedeza, not cerisa, just this is an annual. Um, mung beans, radishes, and mini pumpkins. And this year when I put them in, I put in decorative gourds instead. And the beautiful thing Dale tells me about the pumpkins and the gourds is that they will vine over to where there's daylight and then put their big leaves out and um, therefore your soil is covered. And it, um, when the raindrops come down, it just kind of breaks up that splash and um, it also um, provides cover so that the weeds aren't growing there too. And the cattle find those when they're grazing the stalks after the milo harvest. And at first they just ignore them and walk past them and then somebody accidentally steps on one and then another comes along and, and takes a bite and they go, oh, and then they start <laughs> running around the field trying to find these little pumpkins to eat. Uh, another experiment I did this year was uh, no-tilling rye into a native pasture. I would not do this if it's pristine native pasture, but if it's go back, um, this is something that you can try. This is what it looked like when, when it was time to turn out on grass this year because we were so terribly dry. This is our native. And this is what it looked like when the camera was sitting on the ground. That's how tall it was. And um, This is where I no-tilled the rye into the same uh, pasture. And this is what it looks like when you have the camera on the ground. And we ended up um, calving on this this spring and it regrew enough to keep um, those that were calving um, supplied with something fresh and green yet at the same time it protected um, the calves from um, the soil and uh, it also then as soon as it got warm sort of petered out and we had grazed it enough that it did not come back and it did not go to grain. And this is uh, some roller crimping that we did um, on that first field that had flooded years ago. And um, this is what it kind of looks like for that and how you can get a hold of me. So thank you very much. Awesome. Okay, Lucinda, has your family always done cover cropping? Can you kind of give us the dynamics of, I mean, you know, did you just say, have you been doing this forever? What's, what's the backstory here? Well, we do farm in um, sort of a um, old fashioned way in that we have always rotated our cattle. We've never stopped doing that. Um, but cover crops came about in an interesting way. Um, in, in 2004, my husband came home, no, 2005, my husband came home from a meeting probably no till in the plains or something like that and said I'm going to do something really crazy. I am going to plant spring wheat or no excuse me spring oats in wheat stubble 
and I'm going to see what's what, what it does. He chose the back half of a field that couldn't be seen from the road and planted it to uh, spring oats. And after it was about chest high, before it froze, um, we were like, okay, now what do we do with it? Um, and we were um, having a hard time um, having enough grass for our cattle that particular year because of the dry summer. Um, and although it didn't affect the oats, the oats were doing great. And so we just decided, okay, we'll put a hot wire around it and we'll graze it. And they were there until the end of February. And when they came off of that, it looked like we could take them to the fair and win. They were, they were sleek, they were happy, they were well filled out. Um, they were not suffering one little bit. And uh, they just did so well on it, we decided to do it again. And my husband was kind of upset that he didn't do the whole field to that. But, you know, um, and that's how we got our start in cover crops. And fortunately, we had a good year that first year because it convinced us to keep going, even though nobody was nobody else was doing it, and everybody thought we were crazy. But um, we benefited so much, and that was that much less hay that we had to to make or to find. So um, it was just both economically beneficial, um, very beneficial time-wise. Um, we um, had um, much better health for our animals. Um, and um, when you have better health, less veterinary bills, um, they sell better. The calves uh, sell better at the um, sale barn or, or um, private sales. And um, the load that we took to the sale barn this week, we were the top uh, price for our weight um, uh, class. Uh, at the sale barn, and I hate to sell them at the sale barn. I'd rather sell them privately, but uh, when you have too many, <laughs> that's what you need to do if you don't have a ready buyer. So that's how so we got started. How many are 100% of your acres now in a cover crop system? Everything has a crop on it, whether it's a commodity crop or a cover crop or, or native pasture. And we're going to start experimenting with some pasture cropping as well. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, okay, so tell me what what is pasture cropping? Go down that. If you have a cool season pasture, then you know till a uh, summer annual into it, um, like maybe your summer uh, cover crop mix. If you have a warm season pasture like native, then you no-till uh, a cool season in it, like I had cool, had no-tilled the rye into the native pasture, and we use that for calving on. Um, and by the way, that pasture, the native pasture that I had no-tilled the rye in, the um, native is coming back better than it has in years past. So I, I think it just said, oh, wait a minute, um, we're here, we're growing, um, you know, um, don't, don't take us out. Um, we want to we wanna, um, actually, I, or either that or the, um, maybe the root exudates leaking out of the um, dying rye um, gave them a little bit of a boost. Whatever happened, it's doing better. <laughs> so what a... What other things are you guys doing on, on your operation that you think help increase your profitability? And just for everybody out there, since we have people all over the world, what's your annual rainfall? It's around 30 inches a year. But um, that's if you have an average year. Um, uh, three times in the last 16 years that I've lived on this farm, uh, we have had a 100-year flood um, and it flooded out on um, both sides of the creek bank. And the creek is actually down 20 feet from the, um, from the banks to where the top of the water is usually. So that's quite a bit that it has to come out. And what happens is there's these six inch rainfall events that are 
pop-up showers and they rain above us, we don't always get the rain ourselves, but we get the benefit from their, their runoff. Now, if everybody did cover crops above us and to the west of us, that would be great because then there wouldn't be so much coming down on us so fast and we wouldn't have the flooding events, or at least they wouldn't be as serious. Um, I'm also planting one, the place that floods along the creek to a, um, I need more cool season grazing. And so I'm uh, planting that to a, um, a flood resistant uh, cool season uh, perennials. And it'll be in perennials for a while. Um, I'm not sure how long, we said three to five years, and then we'll try crops again um, because the crops probably will do about 15 uh, bushels per acre better um, after it's been in a pasture or perennial setting. So we'll see, we'll make that decision later. Um, and then approximately how many of your neighbors do you think are utilizing cover crops in your in your immediate area? And then maybe talk a little bit broader, um, incorporating some of the educational focus that you have. Well, the farmers around us are, are fairly intelligent. And um, at first, I'm the crazy lady and uh, the talk at the local cafe. Um, but then I noticed one or two years later um, that they're doing the same thing. Um, there was a feature article in, on the front page of our local newspaper uh, about one of my neighbors uh, planting a beautiful cover crop right beside the road. And it had um, quite a few varieties of things in it, including sunflowers. And people were going out there and taking pictures um, in front of it. So that was really great. It was awesome to see. And maybe he had the idea before he saw mine, but. Um. <laughs> you know, I, I think that's hilarious, you know, because a lot of us that do things different, whether it's an agriculture, um, it is kind of hard to do things different in your own town. And, you know, speaking of crazy people, Dale Strickler, um, trying to cue him back up here. <laughs> You know, Dale, when you guys are out having these conversations, not only just about cover crops, um, it does take a while for people to be willing to make a change that goes against the system of, of what they've learned. Um, you know, what's, what's kind of a way, I mean, obviously we've got people from all over the world right now. So the mindset we've already got um, maybe established on this call, but, but how do you continue to have that conversation that's so far out of the normal? Or maybe Dale, you're just used to being the crazy guy. I don't know. You tell me. I, I am honestly, um, <laughs> since I was a little kid. Um, I've, uh, I think the way you do it, uh, the absolute worst thing you can do is say, you're stupid, do it my way. That, that just causes people to dig their heels in and become even more recalcitrant. And so you basically have to start at a point of mutual agreement. You know, what, what do you agree on? And I think everybody realizes that, uh, you know, soil organic, more soil organic matter, let's just throw something out there, more soil organic matter, everything else equal, more soil organic matter is better. Everybody agree? Okay. So um, you look at, okay, is there more soil organic matter in that pasture sod right over there or in this tilled cropland here? Well, obviously, I mean, with a shovel, you can tell that there's obviously less soil carbon in the tilled ground. I said, why is that? Well, it's been tilled. Okay. So tillage reduces soil carbon, right? Uh, yeah, I guess so. So what would happen if you stop tilling? You know, and, and let them don't, it's counterproductive to tell people things. It's much more productive to have them tell you things. I, I always said that the class I wish I had in college that was never offered was one called dad management where you make everything, make him think everything is his idea instead of yours. 
and then change happens. Um, people are much more receptive if they came up with the idea themselves. And a normal intelligent person, if you lead them along this step of logic, take them through the same process. You know, I didn't, I did not. I remember when I went to college, I thought no-till was a joke. You know, said so you, you can't raise a crop without tillage. Well, why not? Well, if, because I'm smart and if, you know, my dad is smart and if, if that was a smart thing to do, my dad would already be doing it. <laughs> That's not sound logic, by the way, in, in case you missed the irony there. But um, that is our thought process a lot of times. You know, it's like smart people buy Fords. Well, why is that? Well, because I drive a Ford and I'm smart. So, you know, circular logic here. So, um, you know, you basically have to start at things that everybody agrees upon and then start them down. You know, I had to make observations before I ever got off this tillage is a good thing sort of deal. Fallow is a good thing. You got to store moisture, you know, take them through the observations that I saw that led me down this path and things that everybody agrees on, you know, and ask questions rather than tell people things. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, so Lucinda and Dale, we, we talk a lot about, Dale, you referenced the percentage of folks in the total population that grew up on a farm and are um, actively, farmers are engaged in agriculture. What is your opinion of now it feels like the world is having this awakening to soil health, to regenerative, and over the last couple months, my observation is that if any company out there in the world wants to become regenerative, all they have to do is write a press release. So people send me a press release and, and they say, they say, well, Jessica, what do you think of this company? They're going to do this. They're going to do that. I'm like, this isn't to me, that's not action yet. And I always say, let's watch the work that they do. So Lucinda, you're laughing about that. I mean, what do you think about what we're doing now? It's being put out there for the world to almost um, see. And that's, that's a, a change we've had in the last 12 months. Would you agree? I, I agree that the mindset is starting to open up and uh, people are talking about what they're going to do. I believe it more when they have done it um, and put their actions where their mouth is uh, and actually accomplish something. Um, talking about it is, is great to get started, but I would like to see it followed up with actions and then I will believe it. Uh, there, there's an awful lot of greenwashing out there. I don't know if it, if it's soil health, is it now called brownwashing or what? It, I don't know. <laughs> is brownwashing the term when you're promoting soil health? No, uh, I think that's something different, Dale. <laughs> I don't think that's what it's called. Did I use an offensive terminology that I'm unaware unaware of right there? <laughs> so, but I don't know. But but greenwashing, yeah, I mean, so much of it is greenwashing and attempt to gain favorable PR. And um, and that's not necessarily bad, you know, if 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 they are truly doing something that is is positive, you know, they should get positive PR for it. It's See when people people, you know, put on a show and actually accomplish nothing other than improve their bottom line and increase sales, that's an issue. I think it becomes very reductionist. And I think we've seen this in the um, scientific community as well as like the university systems because a systems approach is so hard to measure and it's so hard to quantify that we end up by default going back to that systems thinking and so then we end up only focusing on a single practice or we have practice based um, reward systems when they should be outcomes based reward systems. Um, but the, the science isn't there yet. The technology, I don't even know if it's going to be there. But does that kind of make sense? It's kind of frustrating to be promoting a systems approach, but yet not being able to, to actually like prove it right now. 
how can they how can they make money if they can't sell us something? I know, you know Ca- Cassie and gone, Tom. We've gone from spending four hundred thousand dollars a year on fertilizer ten years ago to now spending twenty five thousand dollars a year. You know, the the big it just seems like as soon as we change our farming practices, they want to sell us something different. Mm. Gets me frustrated. Yeah, so Cassie and Tom, can you guys give us um, an update, you know, talking about this global shift in the awareness of soil health and regenerative agriculture? And then also, can you let me know what time it is where you guys are at? Uh, it is 3.25 in the morning. Here. <laughs> uh, it was 2.30 in the morning when the meeting started. But um, yeah, just that, that general shift in mindset, I don't think... Uh, you know, mass ag is, is there yet, but um, yeah, I suppose where we are, you know, we, we moved to a zero tool system 20 years ago and 10, 10 years ago, it just got to a stage where I got sick of, uh, it felt like there was a tap in the bottom of a bank account and the money was just pouring out the bottom. And when you look back at it and you just go, what was I spending all that money on? And it was on fertilizer and chemical and, and all the inputs chasing yield. Um, instead of actually chasing plant health, soil health and, and profitability. So, you know, there's still a mindset in Australia where that, that more on method, we're calling it, you know, more on, more on, putting more on, um, it's still there, absolutely. But, you know, it's taken us 10 years to try and get away from that. Yeah, it's the more on uh, uh, mindset. And it's not a good one. You know, I find it interesting. Agriculture is the only industry on the planet that tells you to don't change, do things exactly the way that, that you've been trying to do that and not care about, you know, like what your consumer wants. Apple, and then and then you're forced into doing it because it's the only way that you can be supported and have, you know, um, any sort of insurance. If you were a company like Apple that produced iPhones, what do they do? They produce a brand new iPhone every single year and they just expect the consumers to adopt their changes year after year after year for improvement. I find it so bizarre that in agriculture, um, you know, we, we don't find ourselves as adaptive to what the the consumer is telling us you know that's a whole nother can of worms right there isn't it absolutely lucinda i see you shaking your head on that one um what are you think oh you just put a message in the chat go ahead oh um i was reading the chat and trying to figure out what else needed to be answered um when you uh, Frank was saying that he couldn't get the academics to acknowledge that he was doing a better job and um, reducing his um, his his runoff and his um, um, degradation of the soil um, and was able to get actually something growing um, places where they weren't growing before and sometimes you have to just bring in people from outside the academics and have them publish in uh, popular um, magazines, ecological magazines, local newspapers about what a fantastic and innovative job you're doing. And then the academics will catch up in five years or so, um, five to ten years. So, uh, yeah, just um, go in the back door on that one. And uh, somebody else asked about carbon credits and about what we've been doing for years. And it's interesting because several companies have contacted me. Would you like to sign up for our carbon credit um, thing? And then when I go through their questionnaire, they'll go, oh, you're already doing these things. We can't help you. We can't give you anything for the carbon credits. <laughs> and it's like, what? I'm light years ahead of others. <laughs> and I can't even get you know any benefit for it. Are you kidding me? This is not not right. This is not fair. Yeah, and I think that's what I was kind of alluding to earlier about we've, you know, first of all, the carbon credit system is the Wild West. To my knowledge, and anybody can correct me on this, there hasn't actually been a carbon credit officially transacted. I mean, there's been pilot studies. There's been private companies that have paid XYZ for 
an established rate of carbon that they're determining. But as far as having anything like on an actual market, I think it's still to be determined. And the same thing, you know, I think what ends up happening is getting back to what Dale talked about the people determining agricultural innovation may or may not have been the folks that grew up on a farm. And so we're now reduced the thinking of carbon credits down to additionality versus uh, an ecosystem's benefit or some sort of outcome that's measurable, whether it's cleaner water, whether it's you know better infiltration, whether it's a more nutrient dense crop. So that's kind of what I see GPR just for full disclosure, we get asked probably weekly to comment or to maybe support one system or another. And um, the way that I'm viewing this topic right now is I don't see enough information to really validate any one particular uh, situation. So, hey, somebody else, Frank, did you have any, you had your camera off or you had your camera on, sorry. If anybody else has any input, feel free to hop in here. Um, <clears throat> yeah. If I can, um, I thanks, Lucinda. Um, I we're actually approaching it a slightly different way in um, in getting our views out um, because you just ignore the big farms because they know it all. You ask them. Um, so what we're doing is we're looking at um, escapees from the city, the people who have moved from the city onto smaller holdings and actually want to um, attack farming with a slightly softer touch. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, we uh, just recently, uh, the local FM radio station, the community radio station, asked me if I'd um, present and post and present a half hour dedicated program to how we, how we run our farm and it's called Our Farm. And uh, it's on once a month and uh, it's gonna be interesting to see. We've already had some, some really good feedback, um, but it's, it's funny when folks come to our farm and have a look at what we're doing, especially with our landscape management and our water management, um, they just can't believe um, that we've got grass to feed the stock in dry times. And um, it's, uh, it, it's just really um, uh, uplifting to have people say to you, oh, gee, how come you've got all that grass <laughs> to feed the sheep? Um, and the other thing, I put a thing up there earlier, um, if you follow the line of make the livestock fit the landscape, not the landscape fit the stock, you've got a head start. I think that's fantastic. You know, um, you were talking about doing this kind of on a smaller acre system. What is the, what is the average size? Like what's small acres for you guys over in Australia? Uh, <clears throat> well, our place is 500 acres. Um, okay. Most of the, so most of the people that are coming onto the land, um, especially, like I say, ones from the city, um, they're coming onto 100 acre lots. And, um, and generally speaking, it's not that flash of country. Um, the, our district was originally nearly all wool producing district. And then after the the floor crash after the price of wool crash when the government stopped supporting it, um, they all changed the cattle. But um, except if for a few parts, um, cattle are too heavy for our granite country, mm. and um, and and so they, you know, they they the agriculture the uh, suppliers got in, and so they ploughed it and they seeded it and they sprayed it and they fertilised it. As soon as we get four weeks of dry, the whole lot bloody dies and then they have to start again. So, you know, it's um, if you can convince people, um, what I say to is when when I talk to people, if they've recently they've recently bought their farm, get on the veranda for 12 months and just look at how your land works and then 
start thinking about what its capabilities actually are. And if you work within the capabilities of the land, um, the cost of production drops dramatically and, um, and you're a lot happy. Yeah. And so Mm -hmm. well thank you frank um that's that's a that's a lot to think about and that takes me to my next question dale um since you've you are out and about and um you know full speed ahead on events oh my when you see is unstable you're yeah. still hearing me okay let's see frank i'm gonna I, it was kind of cutting out for me, Frank. So uh, thank you so much for that. Um, but Dale, do you see the small acre farmers showing up to the meetings right now? And um, I'm going to preface this with we've got a nonprofit project that we're thinking about in Nebraska. It's on two center pivot irrigation. It's a corn soybean rotation, and a particular group wants to take it to regenerative organic. And um, I really have this sense that unless we're working with the existing landowner on this conversion and the existing tenant and, and drawing up maybe a three-year plan for tr transition or even longer, um, I worry that if if new tenants come on the land and try something too drastic, I don't know, am I, am I being overcautious in thinking that? How would you how would you uh, give advice on somebody taking over new acres and wanting and wanting to kind of go in pretty hard? Uh, I would say treat it like a marriage. Communication is key, and uh, failure to communicate is is lethal. And so I would, you know, start start asking the landowner, you know, what are your goals? what would you like to see? Some landowners just want their income maximized at all costs. Uh, those may not be the, the landowner you want. Uh, others uh, say, I want to pass my land on in better condition than how I received it. You know, they, they want it to be part of a legacy. And that's, that's very important to know. Uh, what are the landowner goals? And if the landowner goals are to make create better soil, then you've got something to work with. So how would you approach that center pivot irrigation corn soy rotation in a soil health manner? Like is cover crops your first MO? What do you do? Gosh, there's so many variables there. Uh, I think first question is uh, how critical is it to remain in that corn soybean rotation? Is that's like, you know, asking how can I, how can I build, uh, how can I remain healthy by and still smoke and drink every day? You know, it, it's, it's like, it's gonna be pretty tough. You know, there are things you can do, but the, the, the corn soybean rotation is, is not a conducive way of building soil health. There are things you can do to, to make it better, but you really have to break out of that rotation. And so many people are not willing to do that. Um, you know, how, how acceptable are different measures? I mean, are you willing, said, are you willing to no-till? Okay, maybe so. You, that's easy enough in a corn swimming rotation. Can we do winter cover crops? That's easy enough to do in a summer route. Are you willing to go to a three-year rotation, four-year rotation? Oh, oh, you mean there'll be years I don't raise grain crops? Uh, well, yeah, but you can graze. Well, that means I'll have to put up fence and water systems. I don't know about this. So it, it's, you know, find out where the limits are and, uh, you know, the fastest way to build soil health is to plant perennial pasture out there and graze it. And that, that makes extremely rapid impact. But the perception, the, the conventional wisdom is that you can't raise you can't create income off pasture like you can on grain crops. 
Yeah, and I think the limiting factor is this group wants to purchase the acres and the acres are probably going to appraise at about $12,500 an acre. So um, I'm actually nervous about the project from the get go and I'm not positive that taking it out of a corn soybean rotation is wise. Um, initially because of having to, to you adjust. Have, you have to make the annual payments yep. and, and gr grain crops create an annual return and they're fairly predictable. We know mm -hmm. how they work and they're, they're mentally easy. You know, you don't have to do a lot of fancy planning. And so, yeah, that, that timetable is, uh, sometimes you do things for the, uh, to make the mortgage that you know are not not wise long term, and I think that's what that's what um, non agricultural folks don't really understand that context when it comes to to why are you farming the way that you're farming. Um, I know I've had to learn some hard lessons over the years with our own 150 acres of cropland that we farm and the decisions that we make. So yeah, definitely a lot of questions. Well, folks, since we've only got about 20 minutes left here and I want this to be very interactive, um, we've got people from all over the world here. If you would like to ask a question, I would just encourage you to turn on your video and unmute yourself and you can go ahead and ask anything you'd like to to our speakers today, Lucinda and Dale. So um, feel free to unmute yourself and get going. Um, meanwhile, uh, Deanna Lazinski posed a, a statement in the chat box. She said you could just convert it gun smoke style. So Deanna, give me context to that. So I'm assuming that you're referring to the operation in your neck of the woods that was working on transitioning. Was it like 10,000 acres? How big, how big was this operation? I think it was, I think it was, I think it was 30,000 acres and wow. they came in blazing and going to turn it into, um, regenerative organic and they didn't take any of the steps. <laughs> like there was, they just, they were just going to do it all. Um, the difference is that it was not run by any farmers, you know, that knew what to do. They just thought this is how it should be done. We're just going to go in and change it all right away where, you know, soil health takes time and healing the soil takes time and it doesn't happen overnight. And these people that want instant gratification to show us how easily it can be done which is a joke, but, um, they were just, you know, that's what they did. And it, and it was a complete failure, complete. Failure. Well, and I think that, okay. So there's been a number of reports that are asking questions of like, why aren't farmers adopting more soil health practices? And the one that I keep seeing over and over again was lack of trusted advisors. Do you, I don't, I guess I don't even know who was advising this project, but it looks like they, yeah, it, it's, it seems to me like that's a prescriptive mentality. If you're going to do something on 30 acres, it sounds to me like they just wrote a prescription for 30 acres, 30,000 acres, and said, we're going to crop it all the same. Um, Dale, I see your audio is queued up here. Did you have any input? Uh, I had a brief conversation with those folks, and they were very resistant to advice from anyone. Interesting. That's really interesting. I mean, that that's not good for us trying to make changes, you know, and trying to guide people and to give you, advice. You hate, you hate to see failures in this endeavor because it's the, you know, nine, nine out of 10 people succeed just fine in this, but the neighbors always look at the one failure and point that out. See, that's what happened that dog got bitten by a man. See, so, you know, that's, that's, that's what always happens is that people bite those dogs and, and no, that's not what always happens, but it's very con conspicuous failure. And, um, and, and like Deanna said, um, they, they were very resistant to mm -hmm. obtaining advice from, from any source. So Dwayne Beck's wife gave a quote in this article. She said um, that 
it's simply difficult to grow crops organically on a large scale, especially in the semi-arid part of the country. And in summation, she says the environmental marketing got ahead of what farmers could actually do. Holy crap, that's big. Because that's what I was talking about earlier. The best way to become regenerative is to write yourself a press release. So as farmers, you know, we have to be real cognizant of, of what the message is out there and making sure that the message aligns with what is possible. And I deal with this a lot with Great Plains Regeneration with having to figure out what is the message of what we're capable of doing. Um, yeah, who's got input on that? I'll put this quote in the chat. I, um, I, know, I know you're talking about advisors here, but you know, going to all the soil health con conferences and stuff like that, you can listen to all the advisors in the world, but the best information you're going to learn is either having lunch or drinking a beer afterwards because they're the guys, they're the farmers that have got skin in the game. They've got families there living on farms and they've got to be profitable to be able to put, you know, food on the table and clothes on, on children's backs. You know, you can listen to an advisor as much as you like. And I'm, I'm not an advisor person, um, you know, but it's the farmers that have done it, been there before, you know, learnt it. And it might be one little bit. And, and I tell people I've travelled around the world and I've picked up little bits from everybody's farm and I've brought it home and I've tried it. And that's all people can do. Yeah, that's why GPR, we focus on farmer-led education. Um, and that's tricky. That's tricky to do because um, nine times out of 10, maybe 99% of, of the time, a, a guy is not up there trying to sell a product. He's trying to be transparent and he's trying to, to show what worked and what didn't work. And I say this every conference, let's talk about the failures. We need to have a failures forum Typically we should have beer involved because I think it'd be a lot easier to kind of like open up about the stuff you screwed up on if we were all drinking beer. Um, and we can do that next month at the GPR fundraiser in Lawrence, Kansas on August 21st. Uh, but, but Dale and Lucinda, I mean, I've sat around with you guys and that's where, that's where the guts of the learning comes from is the hallways um, you know, after how do you, you know, Dale, you guys do sell a product. Obviously you guys sell cover crops uh -huh. and, you know, um, but, but even green cover seed has been hugely supportive in farmer led education. That's why you guys don't have huge sweeping events for a thousand people. You support the field days at the farmer level of the folks that are wanting to do the education. Um, I, uh, Yeah, <laughs> and I, I love working for this company. I really do, Be, because that is the focus, the, the education. So it, it's someplace I feel very comfortable because I, I know I'm not going to get punished when I give somebody ad, advice that does not lead to a sale. Um, and I, I, want, I want my customers to feel confident that I'm giving them advice that will make them more money, not make me more money. So, and sometimes my monthly commission check reflects that, unfortunately, but um, the, yeah. Um, uh, lost my train of thought here. but uh, No, that's okay. Lucinda, what other tools, you know, you mentioned in the chat that the, the green cover smart mix buying calculator, I have shared that calculator to so many different folks. What it is, is you can go on online and, um, oh yeah, somebody said Dale Strickler, a salesman with integrity. How rare. Uh, that's our good buddy, Gail Fuller. I was trying to cue him up earlier to there, talk there's, about. There's a question to how much of a salesman I am. Yeah. <laughs> Or how good of a salesman I am. Well, you're an excellent author. Please buy Dale Strickler. He gives me $10 every time I mention his books, by the way. So please, uh, Dale, I'm going to send you that invoice here in a little bit. Um, but yeah, the, the Drought Resilient Farm and the Managing Pastures. And I heard there's another book coming out. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the Complete Guide to Restoring Your Soil will be out this fall. So just in time for the winter meeting season. Yes. Lucinda, what other tools should producers be thinking about that they can take advantage of for free? 
Um, I don't know, but when I first um, started managing the farm after my husband's death, um, I met um, the Burns, Burns is from, from Korean Cover C before they started their company. And what impressed me most was integrity. And it'd be great to um, just be able to patronize those that are that have integrity and don't try to sell you something. Their biggest emphasis was education over over sales. And um, I wish more companies were like that because they would be more believable that way. But another thing I did was attend um, a lot of extension classes and the best extension specialists were the ones that had worked in the field most of their life and they retired to become a specialist and if you can find some of them they're worth listening to because of one of the retired veterinarians who became an extension specialist in um, in the ag department at K-State um, actually told me that if you feed roughage from um, sunset to sunrise, that 86% um, of your calves will be born during the daylight hours. And that was great because I didn't have to go check the cows every two, two hours. But also then moving the calving period from, from uh, the middle of winter to spring when the deer are fawning, then I don't have to check them hardly at all. So. Um, just little tidbits like that from somebody who's actually been there, actually done it, um, is great. And so farm tours are the best. I always learn something from the farm tour, whether it's what was on the agenda or not. Usually it wasn't. It's something I'm, I'm seeing as I'm going on the tour. Um, those kinds of things are actually more helpful than a research project from a university. I would hope that someday the research projects will catch up with uh, what people are, what farmers are actually doing. But on the other hand, regenerative isn't really something that you package and sell. Um, so maybe there isn't a profit in it, and maybe you can't get tenure by doing that kind of research at a university. Yeah, I do. It's it's you know this the systems approach the um, it it doesn't fit. You know we're we're gonna have to reconstruct how we view success and reconstruct how we do the education and you know build a better model. So um, just kind of wrapping things up so that we are on time for our call. I really want to thank everybody for being here. There's been a huge amount of different countries represented. And I want to turn a little bit into what you can expect in the future. So Great Plains Regeneration, as I mentioned, we're hosting a fundraiser on August 21st. And anybody on the call that's an advisor or a board member to GPR, or if you're a keynote speaker at Fuller Field School, Sarah Keough, um, would you mind turning on your cameras? Because we're going to chat a little bit about the direction that GPR is going. So. Um, First off, I've got, oh, we've got a few more people coming on here. I've got Gail Fuller and Darren Unruh queued up here. Um, Gail is a co-founder of Great Plains Regeneration and a founding board member. And Darren Unruh is an advisor to our committee, specifically on our new market development crew. So guys, um, thanks for being here. I wanna announce that GPR is making beer. We are making a uh, brew with a company called Wilcott Brewing out of Holton, Kansas. The beer is going to be a hazy wheat beer. So it's actually called white wheat and it's a German beer. And it's gonna have similar undertones to like a blue moon. So it'll have coriander and orange peel. And this is actually just a, a fun beer that we're doing for the fundraiser. But this idea has snowballed into the production of a beer that's actually going to go to market. So we got some of the ingredients from Darren. Mr. Darren Unruh, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Yeah, you know, so tell, tell us, go ahead, man. Well, I didn't, so I really, I really appreciate what Dale had to say earlier in this 
in this conversation. Well, and listen to you too, of course, on the, on, on the community building thing. So Gail and I were having a conversation just yesterday, as a matter of fact, about, about this very thing. So us as producers, as farmers and ranchers, we're good at production and that's where our passion, passion lies. There's, there's, we're probably leaving some profit on the table by not further processing some of this stuff. And if we're not good in, at that, that's okay. That's fine. It's find somebody in your community who is, who, who is looking for that opportunity. That's the way that we build more of those um, nine man football teams, uh, Dale, um, it, and build, build community and provide, um, you know, for our local community is by finding those people who are interested in, in further processing the products we produce. And I, you know, whether it's beer, flour, um, um, you know, more small processors, we have a lot of need here in, in rural America for, for this very thing and then direct marketing. And I, I see Deanna, you're smiling because you agree with me on all this, I'm, I'm sure. And, and so the challenge to me is to, is to find those connections. That's a great thing about GPR um, is getting together with you guys and bouncing some of the, these ideas and stuff off for that local, or I think it's probably gonna be more regional food systems that we'd like to develop. If we can develop these regional food systems, whether it can start out as, as beer or a, a whole host of other things to further process our stuff, um, I think is really important. I, I think of, you know, vegetables, canning facilities, that that kind of stuff. Um, we all need to be thinking and looking in, in that direction or to support ourselves as, as small growers. Just my and you thoughts. do that. So Darren, you totally do that because I mean, as we were looking at making this beer, we were like, who has, you just happen to have malted turkey red heirloom wheat. Like literally you had it sitting in your shop and you were like, well, oh, Jessica, I've got everything you need. I mean, you're obviously well, thinking of this. Well, listen, it was stuff I just did in my garage for the fun of it to try to grind it and add it to add it to bread. And and my neighbor who home brews also wanted some. So I, but yes, I think it's little, little things like that can lead to different opportunities within rural America. And I think we need to keep looking for some, some of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, like I say, maybe it's a canning facility. I, I, I think this whole thing around food, um, Gail, you chime in here because you've done a lot with, with that and building community around food in your area, but I don't think it, we can underestimate the importance of, of that when it comes to building community. Yeah, that's a great segue into Fuller Field School. Um, I stuck the link in the chat with our keynote speakers. Um, so Gail, thank you so much for joining us today. And you are on mute. Nope, I'm here. Uh, thanks, Jess, Darren, uh, Lucinda, and Dale. Nice job, you guys. You know, Dale's been at this longer than all of us combined, probably, and Lucinda's still my hero. Um, just amazed what you've done with your life and your farm. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, GPR, obviously, you know, we spent 10 months trying to get our feet under ourselves and trying to define ourselves. But for me, it still comes down to regional food systems, resilient farms, Da 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 da. Um, I think what Darren is onto here is is certainly on the right track. We we've, we've got to find ways to value add. We've got to learn how to tell our stories and market or find somebody to do that for us. And you know maybe that's a co-op of millers that are that share that share a mill and but but hire a, a marketer together to market their products. Uh, you know there, there's so many ways to do this. But we've got to find a way. Uh, Darren mentioned vegetables and canning and things like that, and I think that's something we really need to look at. You know, our, all, all of us owe a lot to Brian Lindley and what he brought to this movement. And, you know, Brian was trying to tell us 10 years ago that we need to be moving vegetable production out of California and Arizona and into the Midwest and start looking at regional food. And he was laughed off the face of the planet. But anybody today that isn't paying any attention to the news and thinks that California is still going to be growing our food in another six to 18 months, completely wrong. We, we're, we're gonna be a food desert in this country really fast. 
uh, without some major changes in, in the weather and in the climate because the, you know, the West Coast is drying up and burning. So this is something we've got to get figured out. We've got to get figured out really fast. And with that, I'll sit down and shut up. No, you're not going to, because I feel like you, you know, that's, that's so important. And you, that's exactly the conversation that we've been having all these times to form a new nonprofit. But um, I stuck in the chat, the link for Fuller Field School and Gail, this is the 10th anniversary of Fuller Field School. I mean, this is big time. You've got Sarah Keogh, Nicole Masters. Um, there's over 120 people that are registered to come to this. Um, so why do you keep doing a field school? Uh, that's a really good question. It's, I, I guess it's because of all the money I make. That's probably the, the main reason that I do it. Uh, <laughs> I just, I don't know. I, my grandmother was a teacher and I guess maybe that rubbed off on me more than I thought. I've just, I've always enjoyed teaching, but more than that, connecting people and connecting dots. And, the, and I think the field school has become, you know, it's become a, a almost a monster of its own. And, and Tom, Tom made a great comment. You know, you go to a conference, but all the learning is done in the hallways. And, you know, that if I pay 250 for a really good conference, I should pay a thousand for the networking. It's worth twice that. And I think that's part of what Fuller Field School's become. It's, you know, we, we, we bring in awesome speakers, but it's, it's actually the attendees that have made this thing special and have separated it from all the other conferences. Uh, you know, the, the attendees are made to feel a part of the conference. They, they share, the speakers come to learn, the speakers tell us that all the time. Uh, so I, I think the conversations that we have about that because we do involve the attendees and we share, you know, and we have left and right and female and male and large scale and small scale. And we all come together and instead of arguing about what's right and wrong, we share visions and, and ideas of how to get there. And what can we expect this year? Wow, I, probably the two hottest speakers on the planet with Nicole and Sarah, uh, I think, yeah, you know, I, I just, I'm blown away. And I, each year I'm told I can't repeat this. You know, we can't, we can't top last year and somehow every year we, we pull it off and this year is going to be fantastic. Nicole's observation plus, you know, it, it's rare. You usually have the scientist or the, or, or the farmer that's the doing it from observation. And Nicole seems to be the complete package that does it both. And she really seems to get systems thinking from a really, really large scale better than anybody that I've seen. And then, you know, obviously, if we've learned nothing in the last year, it's our abuse of the planet is leading to not just obesity and health problems and dirty water, but runaway viruses. And the only way we're going to fix that is by changing food production and consumerism. And Sarah, you know, she is... She's an eco-nutritionist who just recently has really come to understand the value of regenerative ag in nutrition. And so I, I think the two of them together are really going to bring a united message on survival of the human species going forward is going to take some pretty major changes on farmers and consumers parts. Awesome. So Lucinda even put in the chat that your attendees, it's, it's amazing. Like you go to this field school and there's you know, world renowned keynote speakers that are just there listening, taking notes, like feverishly listening to Gail Fuller talk and just like taking notes um, and then putting it into their own uh, presentation. But all right, guys, let's go ahead and kind of get this wrapped up. Does anybody else have any questions about Gail Fuller, about Fuller Field School? You know, what he's doing is incredibly mind blowing in the sense that he is, he has been talking for decades about the topics that are now hot, right? Like they're now kind of out there and uh, more of a mainstream. Did you ever think that would happen, Gail? Did you ever think that you could turn on the TV and have people talking about regenerative? Does that blow your mind? Yeah, it, it does. You know, obviously that was a goal of ours a long time ago. And there were certainly a lot of nights that you never thought this was ever gonna come to fruition. And I really don't know what happened, but on, on New Year's day, 2019 or coming into the new year of 2019, you could just feel something changed in, in 17 and 18. Things were starting to click. And I 
you know, several of us talked late in the year in 18, and we all said 19 is it, it's the year. And sure enough, things really started to change then. And, you know, I, I don't know what to say about 20. Uh, I'm, I'm extremely disappointed. I think we had a huge opportunity to make some huge strides. And today, I'm not sure we've done done as good as we could have getting getting the consumers converted when we had their attention about food. And that, that that's sad and a little scary. So hopefully, uh, you know, we can learn from that and, and improve going forward. Well, it could still be in our future, Gail. I mean, you know, things things are still, still our future. things are still pretty wonky. Okay, well, yep. guys, listen, I have another call that is uh, popping in on here, but that was the official GPR webinar. Thank you all who attended. And um, I'm going to be on for just a couple more minutes here if you're going to stick around, but I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Thank you for joining GPR.